Hello, lovelies. Now, I'm hoping you remember the idea from the last episode that Peter shared with us, that the cosmos is organized and moved by cosmic intelligences, even if you've not yet embodied it or grokked it, as Chance hates me saying. (laughs) The reason is that we're going to build on this idea and bam things up again, okay? So as Gordon White of Rune Soup made me understand, when you start looking at the story of history with magical eyes, things get really interesting real fast. And so as we move to Peter's next point, I want you to keep in mind that the cosmos is organized and moved by cosmic intelligences. So to kick this off, we're going to visit episode one of Magical Egypt season two, where the brilliant Robert Baval, who has been, might I say, MIA for too long, has a compelling segment. Side note, I did see a picture of him at Christmas with Graham and he looked great and that soothed my heart as I have been very worried about him. But anyway... In season two, Robert starts quoting all the amazing alignments, measures, and statistics about the Great Pyramid. Today, it is the architect that we have to consider how he designed it, why he designed it. What was the, what was the ideas behind this design? And, and this is where Egyptologists seem to miss the point. And this is where today... People like Gary Osborne, people like my brother, people like others, the University of Barcelona is looking to this, is the design. And this design brings out a a, a intention that is baffling us. Why would he want to use prime numbers? Why would he want to use universal constants? Why is he giving us values that provide geodetic values? Why is he placing the pyramid in this position? Why is he so precise in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the coordinates of its location? Why are we getting all this information being spewed out of this design when he was just trying to design a tomb? Suffice to say, there are too many of these things for it to be a coincidence. You can also look at the work of Ed Nightingale, which is completely underrated in my opinion, as he shows all kinds of crazy alignments for not just the pyramid, but Giza Plateau. We actually have a symposium talk with him about it, and it is mind-blowing stuff. Anyway, back to Baval in Season 2. He asked the question... Not how did they do this, but why? And I think that's huge. A teacher once told me the quality of your questions determine the quality of your results. And at the end of the day, I really do think the why is a much more juicy question. As today, we could possibly build or rebuild the pyramid with our technology if we had to. But would we include all the crazy measurements and alignments? I think not. Because in our materialistic prison paradigm culture, we have forgotten the why. Why they did all of that stuff in the first place. Which is why I loved Baval's question. So since there's a fine line between idiocy and audacity, I will attempt to answer this humongous question and then you can decide which one I actually am. This may take a few episodes and I may ultimately end up being idiotic, but when I tied these ideas together in my head, I got really excited. So I hope you will too. Let's start with what Peter says that follows on from the last episode. Okay, so Peter says the second point, the second point in this view of the cosmos, that the cosmos is organized and moved by cosmic intelligences, gives rise to the idea there is a cosmic order that all lower forms of life mirror the higher cosmos and are actually related to it. So there's a continuum from the highest to lowest levels. And this cosmic order, therefore, provides a blueprint of reality. And this notion of a blueprint is critical to understanding the function of magic in human history. Again, boom. But we're going to have to unpack it, okay? The first bit of what Peter talks about is in the Kabbalion, principle number two. It is the law of correspondence, and it establishes there is a harmony between the planes. 
and that everything, all planes of existence, are connected and in correspondence. Therefore, the macrocosm is in the microcosm and vice versa. And this is better known as, as above, so below. Dun, dun, dun. We say it all the time, eh? One of the people Peter Mark Adams seems to appreciate is Massilius Vicino. So since I like Peter's stories, Vicino is probably worth listening to as well. Vicino explained, I have said elsewhere that down from every single star, so to speak platonically, there hangs its own series of things down to the lowest, underneath the celestial serpent, or the entire constellation of the serpent bearer, they play Saturn and sometimes Jupiter. Afterwards, daemons who take on serpent forms. In addition, men of that kind, sneaky salespeople types, serpents, the animals, the snake weed, the stone draconite, which originates in the head of a dragon, and the stone commonly called serpentine. By a similar system, they think a chain of being descends by levels from any star of the firmament through any planet under its dominion. If, therefore, as I said, you combine at the right time all the solar things through any level of that order, that is, men of solar nature or something that belongs to such men, likewise animals, plants, metals, gems, and whatever pertains to these, you will drink in unconditionally the power of the sun and to some extent the natural powers of the solar daemons. That is from Ficino, Three Books on Life, Book 3, Chapter 14. Very, very cool, eh? Everything is thus part of a multiple chain of spiritual sympathy and correspondence, connecting and interpenetrating all levels of reality. But let's not forget this part of what Peter said, shall we? And this cosmic order, therefore, provides a blueprint of reality. And this notion of a blueprint is critical to understanding the function of magic in human history. Okay, so could the ancient Egyptians have been making a blueprint of reality in order to do something magical? Hmm? Can't you just smell the slightest sweet aroma of what the hell might have been going on? (laughs) Of why they went to so much trouble with these alignments. But how might that work? Well, an excellent place to start to understand this then is a type of magic called planetary magic. And for this, I'm going to refer to the most outstanding work of Christopher Warnock and his book, The Secrets of Planetary Magic. Christopher Warnock's book is an excellent introduction to traditional planetary magic as he is a leading astrological magician and a master traditional astrologer. It contains insights gleaned from a decade of practice and study of conventional planetary magic and is an excellent introduction to traditional astrological magic. He also teaches classes, and I hope to one day partake of them. Uh, But put it this way, (laughs) I have an app on my iPhone that gives me planetary hours and days, so I am dabbling. All right, let's be honest. I wear gold horns and frankincense too when I talk to the sun. (laughs) Anyway, I believe that if we understand the basic idea of planetary magic, we will start to make some headway. So here goes. To quote Christopher, The first and most important secret of planetary magic is the existence and reality of the spiritual realm. Magic and astrology depend on the spiritual connection of all things. Without a firm grounding in the spiritual, planetary magic will be weak and ineffectual. Okay, we already know that the materialistic prison paradigm prevents us from acknowledging the spiritual realm. Still, we also know that this is not the case for all of humanity and that the sages know about it and the magicians know about it and Chance and I did a documentary called The Great Work that discusses it. So all we need is a bit of a mind slip as they say in Rocky Horror, to get there, okay? So continuing on, 
The process of creating a talisman is normally viewed as the process of charging them with some form of energy, but it appears to be more effective to view the process as an interaction with spiritual beings. It is the process of ensoulment, as we invite the spirit to dwell in and vivify the talisman. So let me elaborate. One of the reasons for using planetary magic is to create a talisman, which is mm, kind of a good luck charm. For example, if you want to make an appropriate good luck charm, you might want to steep yourself in the energy of Jupiter, for example, as the vibe of Jupiter is associated with the principles of growth, expansion, healing, prosperity, good fortune, and miracles. So that's a good one, eh? In fact, Lon Milo uh, has a class on how to make a Jupiter talisman, if you're interested. So what Christopher is saying here is that typically magicians see the act of making a talisman as the process of charging the talisman with Jupiter energy, like charging a battery. But Christopher says to think of it more as an interaction with a spiritual being. Think back to Peter's point that the cosmos is organized and moved by cosmic intelligences. Christopher agrees. It is helpful to conceive of the planets as individual persons with their own distinct personalities. We grasp their nature the more swiftly we understand their likes, dislikes, moods, qualities, etc. And he goes on to say that planetary spirits demand to be approached on their own terms and in particular at their preferred times. You cannot make a talisman whenever you want. It has to be astrologically auspicious to the planet involved, hence my iPhone app. Now, those trapped in prison paradigm materialistic culture who believe in astrology if you've even thought about it, probably assume that the influence of the stars and the planets must be that of matter or energy of some kind of electromagnetic field or ray or something emanating from the planets themselves, right? I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. (laughs) I fell into the first category. But it's curious because there's actually no scientific evidence for that at all. None. There is no evidence that there is a material cause for the influence of the stars. However, again, the ancients were not so handicapped by their paradigm and were aware of the spiritual realm. They believed in three domains, the divine, the celestial, and the material. Christopher continues, the universe was seen as one big unified being bound together with spiritual sympathy and correspondences. Matter was less perfect and thus imperfectly reflected the spiritual forms or divine or platonic ideas, considered to be the ultimate reality. Material things were created and then passed away, where the spiritual was eternal by contrast. Each of the three worlds interpenetrated and informed the others. For example, the divine idea of justice appears in the celestial world as Jupiter and in the material world as judges, lawyers, and lawmakers. This is what is called the law of correspondences. So I bet you're thinking, oh, that's crazy, Venice. You think because the moon is in a certain place, it actually affects anything on Earth? Get real. (laughs) Well, in our next episodes, I'm going to provide you with hard evidence from actual materialistic prison paradigm scientific research who have found that it does. We will also hear from John Anthony West and Shwala Delubich, Gordon White, and more Peter Mark Adams. So stay tuned, my lovely. It's going to be good.